Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Duriz, and I'm your host of today's session of online SEO Zras. Originally a real conference. This year we are doing these virtual online sessions with different guests. Uh, you can find our previous sessions recorded at YouTube on Basta Digital channel. My guest today is Bill Slavsky, director of SEO research at GoFish Digital and a blogger at SEO by the Sea. He writes on Google patents, knowledge graph, information extraction, and other search-related topics. So, Bill, it's it's great to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. And uh, please start with your uh, presentation. I'll just uh, remind our participants a uh, small thing about questions. You can ask the questions at Slido. Uh, there will be a link posted in the chat for all for all of you. And uh, welcome, Bill, and start with your presentation. Thank you. Okay, it's good to meet you, Daniel. So I'm talking today about Google patents. I spend a lot of time with patents, usually a few hours a week. Uh, patents come out twice a week in the US at the USTPO website uh, when they grant patents and when they publish new patent applications. And I also look at the WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization website once a week to see anything that's been published there that hasn't been published in the United States. So, uh, getting used to working this and I haven't used, and it's not letting me advance images. Okay, it is, if I click the button. Okay, so why look at patents? I look at patents because the way to analyze a business without looking at marketing or sales material. So it gives me a chance to see what the actual search engineers who work on the search engine write uh, and try to protect this intellectual property. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, similarities between what comes from one search engine to another. So I might see something from Google on visual segmentation of pages and see a, a patent from Microsoft on the same subject and then one from Yahoo on the same subject too. I'm seeing less from Yahoo these days and uh, Microsoft doesn't publish patents under the name Bing. They publish patents under the name Microsoft and they publish a lot of patents that have to do with all the different uh, business applications Microsoft uh, goes through, not just uh, Bing, but it's funny sometimes they'll release search related stuff under the name Microsoft Asia. And then uh, it'll take years for, my, for Bing to catch up. Uh, don't know why. So when I look at a patent, there are a number of parts. It's, it's broken down into a varied number of parts. Now look at all of them because they're all important. But the, one of the most important parts is the claims section of a patent. A claim section is an outlined area that describes what's being protected by the patent. Uh, so there's a long description that's usually supposed to be for somebody who's learned in the art. It's a patent phrase that people use to describe uh, uh, an understanding of what's being patented. And that sometimes varies very much from the claims. The claims are the section that the uh, uh, prosecuting attorneys at the patent office look at to decide whether or not to grant a patent. Uh, and sometimes they're much shorter, but uh, they're worth looking at when you're uh, looking at patents because sometimes Google does something called releasing continuation patents. The continuation patents when they update uh, the processes involved in a patent and uh, they'll republish the patent, the same title, the same abstract, and the same description usually. Uh, sometimes those vary a little bit, but the claims will be new. And to see what's changed in the patent in the process that's being protected, because it takes the original date to the first patent. So that, that's what makes it a continuation patent. It's continuing the coverage, the protection 
of that patent. So look at the claims to see what's new, what's been added. And I cover a number of patents in this uh, presentation. And a couple of them are continuation patents, and I'll point that out. Uh, so one of the first uh, uh, patents that I came across was one that described how PageRank works. And it was originally filed as a provisional patent, which uh, takes some shortcuts and uh, gives uh, patent filers a chance to file an actual patent in place of it to describe it in more detail. But this one uh, has a set of claims that describe in detail how PageRank works. And it's uh, worth looking at these because you get a different perspective than you would in, in like a white paper or something. Uh, or a blog post. Uh, so, so I mentioned continuation patents and Google originally filed a patent for their uh, news ranking algorithm and it was published in 2003. It's been updated three times since then. And the first one focused upon uh, news ranking uh, stories from different agencies, different sources based on something that they called source rank, where they would rank the uh, organization that produced an article. And they've uh, ranked news differently in all three of the updates. The most recent one, they're telling us they're looking for entities in stories. And the more entities and more information about entities that they provide in a story, the higher they'll rank a page. Now, they take news articles and they cluster them. And then they choose representative pages from those clusters as the ones that they rank highest. And so when you go through Google News, you can see uh, there's sometimes links to related stories, related content. So that'll show you more from a cluster, but usually the highest clustered articles are the ones that you're seeing in Google News. And they're at this point looking at entities and how many different entities there are. Entities are people, places, and things. So sometimes if they'll do interviews of a lot of people, that helps count towards the entity count. And they're talking about places. The more places they cover, it seems like the more Google likes that in a story. So that helps a page rank higher. Uh, but this is a part of a continuation patent. So all, th all four versions of this patent had the same title, the same abstract, the same description, but different set of claims that show different things. And it's worth, when you see these, it's worth comparing the claims and seeing which change from one to another, which words happen to be used more, what uh, processes get involved. Uh, now patent is, has a number of parts. One of them is a patent solves problems. And Google will explain what the prior art is, what the old ways of solving those problems are, and then what the problem solving solution in the patent is. And that's what makes a patent interesting. A lot of times they go into detail about descriptions. Uh, so we're gonna look at 12 different Google patents and see how Google's approach problems in them. Uh, so one of my favorites is, uh, I love watching videos on uh, uh, the web. And Google's used to have a way of searching for quotes, looking through knowledge bases, places like Wikipedia. And they try to find who the uh, person saying quote is from, uh, scraping, extracting data from Wikipedia. And they, they've started paying more attention to audio and analyzing it better. And now when you ask for a quote, uh, they'll try to actually give you re results that are filled with videos that show somebody saying the quote. And uh, in this case, it's uh, one of my favorites is, I love the smell of napalm in the morning which uh, was said by Robert Duvall in the movie Apocalypse Now. And he used to be a neighbor of mine in Virginia. He lived about 10 miles north of me. Uh, but Google decided if somebody's searching for a quote, usually they're 
interested in showing other people these quotes and people seeing the quotes. So they rather, rather than tell you who quoted, who was being quoted, they would rather show you the person saying what the quote is. Uh, so it's a continuation patent. In the second version of the patent, they said, uh, we're going to analyze audio. The first one, they said, we're going to look in knowledge bases and tell you what's going on. So it's better to show people, I think. And that's something Google's decided to do more. You see uh, a lot more videos of places like YouTube have more detailed and complete and corrected uh, uh, transcripts than they used to in the past. I did an experiment about five years ago where I went through lots of transcripts at Google to look for errors. And most of them were error filled. And there are a lot less errors in audio now at Google. Uh, so this, this was a question that I had uh, earlier today on, uh, somebody asked on Twitter uh, why they were getting uh, carousel search results, entities. They performed a search, uh, famous uh, American women uh, soul singers. And they got a list like this one that shows the books, they get a list of female singers, uh, Beyonce uh, and, and, and many others. And it was a list of, they had taken the search, a query, turn, uh, return results, turned those results into a knowledge graph and uh, extracted entities from pages on those results and ranked them and showed a list of uh, carousel uh, search results for them with the entities ranked. And uh, it's an interesting way of uh, analyzing data on the web and taking entity information and presenting it in a visual format that makes it easy to look at and read and learn from. So I like looking at local search results and Google's come out with one where they said, we, we've got lots of people taking pictures of things like street views, where they're taking uh, shots of storefronts and what's in the store windows. We want to look at the logos and analyze what, what's being shown in those logos, what they're pictures of. And if you've used Google Lens, you've seen Google getting better at reading barcodes and logos and understanding object recognition, uh, determining what things are. So it, this patent says, we're gonna look at images, we're gonna uh, uh, analyze what's in them and where they're from. Most images have XF data, which uh, tell you information about the geographic location that picture has been taken. And Google can analyze that, read it, understand it, and tell you what types of brands are appearing at what places. Uh, Google can go through a car lot and look at the, uh, logos for the cars and count them and tell you how many different cars of different types are in that parking lot. But Google's analyzing uh, pictures, photographs, uh, or targeted advertisements in some cases to learn about and understand brands. And they're using this brand penetration information to learn about what types of brands are available and what types of places. Uh, so they can uh, get a sense of an idea of what's being sold where. And it's, it's interesting that they're being able to do this geographically. Uh, and they're also looking at advertisements for those types of things. They're getting smarter. A few years ago, Google acquired a, a satellite company called Skybox, which had the ability to uh, go to different businesses, take photographs of their uh, parking lots to see how many cars were there and get an idea of how busy or how slow different businesses were. So they're getting the sense of how businesses work based upon uh, things like what type of brands are in an area. Uh, it's, it's an interesting idea. It's not quite the Google bot that we grew up with or knew because it's not looking at web pages, it's looking at the real world. It's getting the sense of what's going on in the world, how it's happening. Uh, so 
I, I tend to use my phone a lot. Uh, I use it for a lot of different types of things. Uh, a lot of times navigation from place to place uh, is really helpful, but it requires that I run location history on my phone. So Google always knows where I'm at. Uh, uh, that's sort of how location history works. I either, either have GPS working or there's cell phone triangulation or it knows which Wi-Fi access points I'm near. There's other ways of tracking my location. Uh, I'm, I'm taking a photograph near uh, the beach in uh, Solana Beach and it's, it's a sunset uh, and Google is sends me a message minutes later saying, you just took a picture at the such and such tavern. Would you like to send a picture of that to Google My Business? Now, I didn't take a picture inside of the business. I took a picture of the sunset, but it knew where I was and it had an idea of, of what, was, what was going on on my phone. So Google does have a pretty good way of tracking location history. And they uh, contact me every once in a while to ask me to update my location history. Uh, because if you can see from this picture, uh, they're tracking where my car goes and uh, where I stop. And uh, in, that, in that case, there's a missing visit and they want me to add the visit and update it. So they want to know where I'm at at all times. Uh, it's interesting that Google wants to know this type of stuff. Uh, they're paying a lot of attention to mobile devices. Uh, the mobile device, and there's another patent recently, a couple of patents. One of them was about user-specific knowledge graphs from mobile devices, from different applications like chat and emails, Gmail, uh, and so on. And these things can tell a lot about you as an individual and your uh, what activities you engage in, where you go, if you're looking at uh, reviews. It can see what types of restaurants you might be interested in visiting. Uh, if you uh, have memberships in a tennis club or a gym, it can tell that from uh, gmails that you might send to people. Uh, so Google is building up a knowledge base about you specifically on your phone. And it can collect data from that knowledge graph that is building on your phone and use it to answer queries that you might have. Uh, so it's, it's sometimes rewriting queries that you might ask based upon that knowledge graph that's on your phone, uh, which I thought was interesting until, until I get to the next patent, which is uh, an on-device platform for machine learning. Google uh, engages in a practice they refer to as federated learning. Federated learning is uh, Google will look at what activities you uh, take on your phone, uh, what choices you make when you set, set up, you have a set of search results, uh, which things you click on, which things you don't click on, uh, what types of browsing you do what types of habits. It will look at uh, these things. It'll look at, it'll create a bunch of features. Uh, it'll gather that information together and then once a day, it'll upload it to the cloud. It'll mix it with other people's uh, mobile data about how they use their phones. And it'll uh, try to get some uh, lessons learned from all that activity. And then it'll upload that information back to your phone another time during the day. Uh, and it's doing machine learning by collecting all this information, uh, deciding which algorithms to use on, on that information and updating it uh, to uh, aggregate and collect the data. Uh, so Google's doing a lot with a mobile device. It's a lot more than they're doing with uh, computers. You know, if you have a, a desktop computer, you're not connected to the web, Google is not sending information up and down to your desktop computer uh, like they are with the Wi-Fi on your phone. Uh, they can tell a lot about what you're doing 
on the web. And it's not just Android phones, they're doing stuff with uh, Apple phones too. So one of the things that we've been hearing about from uh, Google recently is natural language processing applications like uh, uh, BERT, which uh, is a, uses a transformer to uh, complete queries. So if you have a, a query that's maybe missing a few words, Google will look at, at uh, a pre-trained language model that maybe understands lots of language. It's uh, learned from maybe Wikipedia and uh, Google's book scanning project where they've scanned millions of books. And Google knows uh, which words tend to co-occur with other words. Uh, as uh, John Firth, a uh, uh, linguist, uh, once said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So if, if you perform a query for New York Times puzzle, you'll see the search results that get returned all say New York Times crossword puzzle. Because when most people talk about New York Times puzzles, they're talking about New York Times crossword puzzles. And Bert can fill in the word cross crossword in that query and rewrite it so that you get a more complete query. Uh, that's something how something like Rank Brain works by uh, being able to uh, tell which potential words might be missing from a query. Our BERT, BERT also uh, works with a number of other natural language processing approaches like uh, uh, question answering or query rewriting or predict predicting answer passages from web pages that might have lots of topics. Uh, makes it uh, interesting. Uh, to have a, a computer system that's so smart it's anticipating what you're actually looking for. Uh, so one of the flaws, one of the problems with Google's knowledge graph at first was it's based upon uh, information they acquired from a company called MetaWeb. And one of those was a volunteer-based project called Freebase that would collect information about entities, relationships involving those entities, and uh, at some point, you had companies like DeepMind from Google using systems, uh, extracting entity information from places like CNN and the Daily Mail. I think they chose those because they're formatted easily and it makes it easier to collect information. But they've collected information from website, web pages. It's reading the web, looking or entities, uh, pronouns, uh, and verbs compared to those. So a program like BERT has a, a, a part of speech recognizer. It can tell what type of speech might be used in a sentence, what might be a noun, what's a verb, what's a connector. Uh, and it can break words, it can break things down to triples. Uh, which are uh, subject, verb, object. So Bryce Harper plays for Washington Nationals is a triple because we have entity, action, entity. And we have an association score between them. Uh, so an association score is a confidence score. And how much confidence does Google potentially have uh, that that verb is correct between those two entities? It's gonna look at weights, uh, things like uh, involving the sources of that information. How reliable are they? How popular? Uh, how close are those two entities together in the same or nearby sentences? Uh, and it, it also looks at temporal information about those entities. Uh, so when we had uh, uh, Hummingbird first come out, uh, Google showed off conversational search and, and they showed a search where that was in two parts. The first part, the second part had a pronoun referring to one of the people in the first part. Uh, and Google was able to recognize uh, who was being talked about by the pronoun and re referred that from the first uh, query. So, so Google was doing a good job of tagging 
queries that we perform and understand what entities we mean, who's related to what. Uh, so Google does something that's known as knowledge graph reconciliation, where they're taking a big knowledge graph that has lots of information and they're reversing that type of information. So if, if the uh, knowledge graph has an entry such as Maryland is a state in the United States of America, Google saying, okay, if that's true, then the United States of America has a state named Maryland. The United States of America has a state named California. So they're reversing the uh, tuple to build up the amount of entities they know about and have information about. When you see uh, the word relationship in a patent by Google, it usually involves entities and relationships between those entities. Knowledge means relationships. So that's, that's uh, how we tell that Google's using semantics to build up as much data and as much knowledge about things and how they're related to each other as they possibly can. And we had uh, Paul Hare speak at, at search engine uh, uh, at, a, at a presentation in 2016, where he said Google, it, on how Google works, where he said Google's now looking for entities and queries. And entities, as I said earlier, are people, places, and things, or concepts. If Google recognizes that a query has an entity, Google may take the search results uh, for that query and add knowledge-based results, things like knowledge panels. Uh, people also ask questions, related entities, featured snippets, and so on. So this is a way of augmenting search results by adding additional information. And it's, these are things that uh, uh, if, if a query, if a keyword is a guess at what might return information that suits your informational or situational needs, Google's saying, if we provide additional information about that entity, we may uh, take off more questions, more queries that people might have. We might show information that the person doing the search wasn't quite aware of. We're giving them additional contextual information and we're letting them build upon it. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating idea because you're learning a lot you know, when I first started doing searches, I used to use AltaVisa a lot. And I used to do a lot of searches before I come up with a final search or something because I was learning about what I was searching for. And you, you do find out about things from search results. You, you look at the search results, you read through them, you find new things to add your, to your initial query to update it. And this way of uh, doing that with entities means that you can learn a lot just by doing the search. And I love people also ask questions because one of my uh, hobbies is, is uh, gardening. I'm trying to grow native California plants on my patios. And I'll ask questions about something I got new. I got a Meyer lemon tree. And I asked uh, what type of fertilizer does a Meyer lemon tree use? And Google search on a bunch of other uh, people also ask questions about how often you water that uh, lemon tree, uh, other types of uh, entities that might be related like oranges. Uh, so you spend a lot of time and, and that's partially, I think, why Google does that. So you do spend a lot of time in search results uh, looking for questions and answers. Uh, and Google, uh, people, when people search, lots of people search, and Google's crowdsourcing information. You know, what types of searches people use? What is a canonical uh, query? What, what type of format do people usually ask about certain problems? Uh, what language do they use? Uh, and they're building a question graph out of the uh, uh, query sessions about different topics. So they can, they can usually tell whether or not a session 
term uh, queries in a session are related to each other because they're often about the same topic because they're also very near in time to each other. Uh, and if they see them often asked together, they, they do know they're, they're asked about. And they'll put people also ask questions on pages because of those uh, uh, queries being joined together in sessions like that. So Google's crowdsourcing information from searchers. And you know, here's our, uh, how often you water a Meyer lemon tree. Uh, that's, that's, you know, they ask a number of other questions. And like I said, I learned a lot about gardening from uh, Google search results. Uh, another thing that Google's doing is uh, showing knowledge panels with uh, from different places. Uh, and things like restaurants or, or uh, amusement parks or so on, they show busyness meters. When uh, are good times to be at a place, how busy that place is, how much of a wait there might be, how long you might spend in line. Uh, they're, they're measuring uh, information about uh, visits to a place uh, that have physical locations. And they said in that patent, uh, times may vary based upon what type of place it is. So if you go to a dining restaurant and you spend long enough to eat a meal at a uh, dining table, that's probably a quality visit. If you go to a fast food restaurant, you can spend a lot less time standing at a counter paying and, and uh, ordering and leaving with the order. Uh, but that also counts as a quality visit. So they're, they're trying to track these to see how much time you spend at places. So that little uh, phone in your pocket that's helping you navigate is also telling Google where you're going to, what you're doing at the place. And those were the dozen patents. I wanted to show the variety. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Immensely, immensely interesting. Thank you very much. And now we can uh, do the questions. We already have some on Slido. So if you haven't asked uh, from our participants, you can do that as Slido. So let's start with the first one by Paul. He's asking, what is your process when you are breaking down a patent? It can get so technical. Where is a good place to start in finding the hidden gems of information? That we can base our actions upon. So I where... steal all my secrets of extracting secrets. Yeah. patents. Okay, so I, I uh, right click and copy, copy all, and I paste it into Notepad. And then I start deleting all the redundant language, all the technical language. They, they like reusing a lot of statements like the phrase in some implementations is very popular in patents. And it's, if after the 30th or 40th time, you get tired of seeing it. So you just leave it. They, they like using phrases like n slash or. So I, I do a find n slash or and uh, replace it with n. I, I just go through those and I get rid of lots of words and then I try to make sense of it. And I'll try to label it at some point. This section is about this. This section is about that. And creating the process of creating labels helps me uh, understand what a patent's about. Thank you. Thank you for describing your process. And um, I think not only myself, but other people are interested in when you are reading over these patents, uh, and sometimes it takes years uh, for, for them to be granted, can, can we see future of, of search in, in them when, when you are reading older patents? Can you see what's been happening over years? Uh, and Google, how they change the search based on these patents, or some of them just go unnoticed, unused? but they are some kind of protection for the future. What, what, can, can we somehow um, see what's happening, what's, what's going to happen in the next few years based on these patents? There are some things that you can get from a patent that aren't on the patent and you have to leave and look somewhere else. 
like who the authors are of a patent. You can see that a patent was written by Anna Lynn Patterson. You go to Google, you go to LinkedIn, you look up Anna Lynn Patterson, you find out about her history. You uh, search for her on Google, you see that she wrote a, a, a white paper in 2003 on how to build a large uh, search engine. She, she ended up building the largest 21st century search engine uh, of all time. She built a way to search uh, the Internet Archive using a search engine called Recall, which it appears that Google uh, acquired the data from. And then within two weeks or so, uh, hired her. And she, she uh, worked for Google for a few years, uh, building things like phrase-based indexing, and then left Google to form uh, a search engine called Cool with her husband, uh, which, which uh, had some errors. It was supposed to be a Google killer, but it didn't quite work right. It used to show images that weren't quite related to the search results it was showing. And Cool didn't last very long. Within two weeks of Cool officially closing, Google had rehired Anna Lynn Patterson as a vice president of search. So what, when I noticed she, she published a patent in Google on phrase-based indexing, within five years, there were 20 patents on phrase-based indexing, which led me to believe, hey, there's some, some type of value to this phrase-based indexing. I'm gonna make sure I understand it well and look up everything. Uh, so just looking at this other information, LinkedIn, Google, Googling people, uh, it, it makes a difference. I, I mentioned in, in the patents, there was one on undeviced machine learning. If you search for undeviced machine learning, there are a number of Google papers and patents, uh, paper, well, white papers. There's a cartoon from Google Brain Team about federated learning, uh, which details what it's like. And it's, it's been online for at least two years. I came across it the first time two years ago. Uh, so they've got a lot of information, uh, things like there are a couple of blog posts from Google on federated learning that detail it. That it's been around for a long time. There's not much discussion about federated learning in the SEO world. But it's something that's worth paying attention to. Okay, so so we should be reading your uh, blog posts on on Google patents and and try to see what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do. I I do always link to the patent. So if what I'm writing is a little bit hard to follow. Go to the patent, and that that may be even harder to follow. But yeah, that, that will be definitely. That's why I think there was a question on how, what's your process is because it's it's quite difficult to read through the patents. Yeah. All right, so we have another question in our chat uh, by David, uh, who is asking if you feel that RDF is dead now and everything is schema or schema, I don't know, schema. And, um, and um, do you think that Google, after acquiring Freebase, is still using it to our favor, SEOs in general? So I, I think the question is meant that we are giving... Uh, all these free data to Google, mark them properly, uh, and so on. And then are they using it still to our, uh, I mean, advantage to, to, to advance our websites or, or have they already absorbed all the data and now it's just uh, kind of, they can leverage it even against us? There are a lot of different sources of data on the web. Some of it is in the form of uh, linked data uh, from places like government sites or nonprofits where they're doing the research anyway, and they're publishing that because it's already been paid for. Uh, but a lot of times you have to use like a Sparkle query to look up the information because a regular natural language uh, uh, declaration isn't going to return results from it. And they, no, nobody's really figured out quite how to do that. 
And most people don't use Sparkle queries on a regular basis. They're, they're kind of hard to use. Uh, so you do, have, you do have things like schema uh, where, where subject matter experts are, and, and schema gets updated every, uh, every three months. There's a new version. If you uh, subscribe to the schema mailing list from the W3C, you can get information and people talking about what's going on with schema and asking questions about uh, different aspects of it that's being worked on. And you can see what the updates, when the updates are coming out, what's happening with it. Uh, schema isn't always ideal. It isn't always perfect. There, there are some things, the guy who wrote a lot of schema uh, uh, from Germany, uh, he wrote a good relations database, which covers lots of different aspects of things that might be in schema. Uh, didn't always do the greatest job in the world. He didn't know everything, but uh, it, it's still uh, worth doing. It's worth looking at. Again, it doesn't cover the vast range of uh, linked data that you might get answers to from a Sparkle query. I've, I've seen uh, uh, some databases of like contaminants and uh, consumer products available through uh, apps. And they, they've connected the apps to those uh, 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 databases. And you can look up, you can scan barcodes and you can look up products and see how maybe potentially uh, allergic people might be to them or so on. And they're using that linked data to do that. And that's not data that's available through a search engine. Right. And we have another question. If, if you can maybe from your experience, say if there is any practical uh, use of, of reading through patterns that would actually bring some measurable res results for us, like uh, when Google does some updates that will be well prepared before that, or is, is there such an example that you can? So, so we get some updates from sources like Twitter and we'll have uh, Danny Sullivan tell us uh, about things like neural matching. We go to the patent office website, USPTO, and search for neural matching and you get no results. It's like, why are you making up language that doesn't fit what's in Google Scholar and the patent office? And it's like, you've got to do some reading between, uh, between the lines. You've got to see you've got to figure out what potentially they may have meant when they're talking about something like neural matching. Uh, so the more time you spend with, with a source like patents, uh, you're, you're getting a vision that's not necessarily anticipated as one that consumers normally get, but you're not getting spoon fed, things like neural matching. So you're getting a different perspective, a different look. Uh, so I've read thousands of, of patents. And so that means I've looked at thousands of algorithms. Uh, algorithm is supposed to be a way of solving problems that are in patents. And a search engineer comes up with this algorithm and describes why it's potentially an improvement over prior art and what people may have done in the past. Uh, and sometimes it might be, and sometimes it might be a little bit confusing. All right. and, and, and the language from a patent isn't always uh, the plain English uh, definition of that patent. Like the word content in a Google patent doesn't return, refer to content like you might see on a web page. It refers to content like you might see in a search advertisement. So if Google titles a, a patent uh, and uses the word content in that title, they're most likely talking about uh, paid search. All right, thank you. And maybe mm -hmm. last question, uh, if you can expand on the canonical query concept. <laughs> is, is, there, is there any way we can determine it ourselves? Okay, so Google has 
millions of people doing searches a day. And they're, they're getting the same, they're getting similar queries for certain things. Like people always ask about certain type of light bulb and certain, using certain language or certain type of car. They, they always ask in the same way. And Google's looking at patterns of how things are being asked for. You know, which words, what determines, what question, what words determine that something's a question. Uh, you know, you, you don't get uh, uh, vocal signals like, like a raised voice means that you're questioning something. You don't necessarily see that. Uh, but but people, a lot of people ask for things in similar ways, especially when they're on specific topics and they're, they've uh, clustered together a number of questions about something. Uh, so we see uh, Google, we saw on the web in the early days of the web, people used the word canonical to mean this is the best source of information for this. We see uh, canonical codes of ethics for judges where they've, they've got a bunch of lists of ethics and different problems and how to solve them potentially or some guidelines for them. And they're, they're being referred to as canonical. Uh, so, so it's sort of a, a, a set of guidelines that, that tell us how something looks or is shaped or maybe referred to or answered. Uh, and a canonical query is how do people, how do most people typically refer to something? How do they, most people ask about it? What are they looking for? When you get a query, something like, and this isn't intended to be pornographic, but it's uh, an example from a patent. How long is Harry Potter? And they might mean how long is the movie Harry Potter? They might mean how long is a podcast about Harry Potter? They might mean how tall is the character Harry Potter? But they're being ambiguous in the query. And what does Google do when it gets an ambiguous query? It tries to answer it. It may be wrong for the, uh, how long is Harry Potter? When I've looked it up, I've gotten uh, movie run times, which is a good answer. It's, it's, it's a good answer. And I think that uh, you even showed the personalized, uh, that patterns that we're talking about, personalized knowledge graph, which are, I think definitely important for this type of search because then they know the history, what you were looking for before, if you are interested in podcast videos and so on. So I think this will somehow fill in the mosaic. So, well, Bill, thank you very much anyway uh, for joining us today. And uh, it was really nice uh, presentation and, and great, great honor uh, to have you here. So thank you again. And thank you for uh, to all our participants for joining. And you can of course follow us on our on Facebook, Twitter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the video uh, recording of this session will be posted on YouTube. So uh, for other people who can couldn't join today, thank you again, Bill. And I will be sharing my presentation on SlideShare. So if anybody's watched and they want to go look at the slides, they can click on links in them to go visit and read the patents and read blog posts I've written about them. Cool, cool, Bill. So we'll get uh, the URL from you and we'll post it to YouTube as well. So people can see your presentation along the, the video. Thank you very much again and Thank everybody you. for participating and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, Dale. -bye. <laughs> Bye,